Welcome to Digital Asset News, the top stories in cryptocurrency and digital assets, and I'll break them down to bite sized pieces. Today, we've got one piece to go over, and it's fascinating. This was by Cointelegraph, they over, they're on YouTube channel, and uh, you should check it out. It's pretty, got a lot of pretty great information. But what they did here is they interviewed Dan Moorhead, who is the founder and running manager of Pantera Capital with 500 million assets under management. And they go over a plethora of topics, a Q&A, where they talk about things such as which is going to do better, Bitcoin or alts, what is the whole thing behind maximalism, uh, Bitcoin maximalism, and what kind of DeFi projects are they invested in and what do they think is going to happen as far as a price prediction in the next year, two years, and five years. So this will branch off into multiple sections where we're going to go over different parts of what he talks about to verify the accuracy, and it's pretty good stuff. So we'll go over all that in a bit, but first, let's take a look at what's going on in the market. So first up, it's early. It is Sunday, September 13th, about 10 a.m. Texas time, and here's what we got going on so over seven days looks like bitcoin's up a percent but down a percent for 24 hours hitting around 10 2. i'm just happy that it's above 10,000. that's all i really care about ethereum actually tipped out around 370 this morning and now it's down to 358 so i'm still pretty happy about that tether's tether and xrp is at a whopping 24 cents watch out Chainlink down four percent but 12 percent up for the week so Chainlink's doing pretty good holding at that number five spot and the darling of the cryptocurrency uh, space on top of DeFi is Polkadot and it's been jockeying back and forth with for that fifth position with Chainlink and it's up 20% for a seven day average. So I'd like to see that uh, pop up a little bit, but what are we gonna do? Binance Coin had a major announcement they're gonna get into the DeFi space. And there was some funny things going on behind the scenes and the whole DeFi project. I'll probably do a video about it, but uh, Binance always has some little controversy going on. Bitcoin Cash, Weird. Down 1.8 for 24 hours, 1.8 for the seven days. So there you go. Crypto.com also getting into the DeFi space. And uh, they had actually had a nice little run for the week at 6%. Now they're down 0.7. And what else we got? Uh, OKB up 13.6. I don't hold OKB, but congratulations to everybody who's holding it. That hasn't really uh, taken off too far. So 13.6 uh, for the day. Fantastic. 27 for the week. Yeah, you can take that for sure. And then also Yearn Finance, unfortunately down 18% for the day, but 52% for the week. It is at 33,000. It has its max supply at around 30,000. And who knows, it could be the uh, the next darling of the space if it isn't already. I mean, I remember when it was at down at 20,000 during that dip and now we're up. And I believe it was almost uh, hit 40 at one point. So not too shabby. Uma, Ave, looking pretty good for the week, just down for today. Sundays are never the greatest days of all time. It seems like everything takes a dip on that point. And Theta, one of my new holds, up 30% for the week down 4% for the day at 50 cents. And uh, I gotta tell you, I gotta tell you, that uh, anything under a dollar is a steal for Theta. They just were granted a US patent for methods and systems for a decentralized data streaming and delivery network. So they're gonna run, they're gonna run that market, they're gonna own it. And uh, if you haven't taken a look at it, now is the time. All right, so let's jump into today's top story because I gotta tell you, it is fascinating. So again, this was a really great interview uh, put together by Cointelegraph, and it goes over Dan Moorhead, you know, the founder of Pantera Capital, and it just has a litany of uh, useful information. And I like to see this type of uh, deep dive. So let's just break in. So first, we always want to see, you know, who is this guy and what are his credentials so we're actually listening to him. So let's just take a listen. Pantera Capital is among the oldest crypto investment firms and among the largest institutions owning cryptocurrency. It has over $500 million under management across three venture funds and four cryptocurrency funds. In 2018, Pantera reported lifetime returns of over 10,000%. So then, can you tell us a bit about uh, your background and how you got to found Pantera Capital? Yeah, I started my career as the first asset-backed securities trader at Goldman Sachs. Uh, it's now a wild turn of events that I'm trading asset-backed tokens, so the world comes full circle. Uh, I then went and spent um, years trading global macro with Julian Robertson and Tiger Management. And when Tiger wound down its investing for outside investors, I founded Pantera Capital. That was 17 years ago. We typically traded normal hedge funds, uh, about a billion dollars of, of uh, opportunistic global macro style hedge funds. And in that, we're always looking for disruptions or opportunities that have very asymmetric risk re reward profiles. So that's the key word, and it's going to be a recurring theme. 
asymmetrical investments. And when he talks about this, I mean, it just totally clarifies everything that uh, we've been trying to talk about on this channel. So that just gives us a little bit of background of uh, who Dan is and what he's doing. So let's just break into it. So the big question is, what's going to do better, Bitcoin or alts? This, this comes to the heart of the matter as far as like Bitcoin maximalism versus everything else. So here we go. We think Bitcoin's going to go up a tremendous amount. And we own, as, as I said, 63% of all of our crypto token holdings are Bitcoin. But we think the smaller cap tokens, the things uh, smart contract oriented, DeFi oriented, they're going to outperform Bitcoin. Bitcoin's going to go way up. Those things are going to go up even further. And that's the whole thing. All the coins are going to perform better. Bitcoin will do pretty well. And that is it's. It's all about what you want to do. And and I, I talked about this in one of the Dan clips where the question was about putting money into into uh, stable coins or not. And um, the whole thing comes down to is where are you at in your life? If you're very young, if you're on the, on the younger side, maybe in your early 20s, this is the time to take risks. This is not a financial advice, but this is what I did. I took a lot of risks when, you know, when I was younger and a lot didn't pay off. That's just how it goes. But the ones that do, um, they work out exponentially well. And you don't have to be right 100% the time you just gotta be right once and you just gotta pay off big so that is that is one of the big things so as you get a little bit older in your 30s 40s 50s or even 60s uh, you tend to be a little bit more conservative and what I do is I have a lot of my portfolio into Bitcoin Ethereum because I believe in them they are a safer bet in one of the unsafest bet arenas, which is cryptocurrency digital assets, because this is the most volatile space. And uh, I have one of, you know, hopefully, I believe, one of the least volatile, uh, which is uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum. And I think they're going to do very well. It's just going to all be about time. Now, it's all about balancing your assets, ba balancing your portfolio out. So again, if you're younger, uh, maybe you should skew your portfolio, maybe a little bit 80 percent uh, more on the lower alt caps because you're just like, you know, what, I want to take a bunch of risks, then 10 percent into something a little more stable in cryptocurrency, which might be Bitcoin, Ethereum. I think it all depends on your plan and really just comes down to whatever plan it is that that works for you. Stick with that plan and don't FOMO in anything. Take the best data and information that you have and then move forward. All right. So the next part, we're going to get into more of the Bitcoin maximalism and that one million unrealistic, I believe, price of Bitcoin going in the future. OK, that's an interesting point of view, although it contradicts what the Bitcoin maximalists say. For instance, Dan Held from Kraken was uh, with us in a recent interview. He said that Bitcoin was the only valuable project in the crypto space and that all the other coins, including DeFi, didn't prove their utility yet. Blockchain tech sucks. It's terrible. It makes so many trade-offs to build Bitcoin that it is basically ineffective for almost anything else. And uh, he also said that Bitcoin has the potential to go up uh, to $1 million in value. So what's your uh, counter argument to that? Before Dan speaks, I got to tell you, that is the most ridiculous thing I've heard in a long time, that blockchain is the most irrelevant type, not irrelevant, but cumbersome and ineffective technology out there. And I just don't see like how, how you can't see the vision of what's going to happen in years to come in three, five, 10, 20 years. Uh, blockchain, distributed ledger technology, and cryptocurrency are going to swallow the entire world whole. And it's not going to be just, just one industry. It's going to be multiple industries across a vast array of businesses. So I just don't see where he's coming from in that one. Oh, you know, I want to say we're massively bullish on, on, on Bitcoin. We own a ton of Bitcoins. And it maybe could go to a million. That is 100x from here. And to me, that's kind of, you know, that's really the edge of, of possibility because you're getting into a number that's 20 trillion and all money on earth is only 100 trillion, you know, so you're really getting to a huge thing at that point. Uh, so I think it's possible and it's not like I'm saying it can't happen, but I think it's high, it's much more likely that the entire DeFi space goes up 100x over the next five years than Bitcoin. And again, it's not to take anything away from Bitcoin. Bitcoin's great. We own 63% of it. It's, it's awesome. It's just these other protocols have much more upside. Because they just haven't been proven. Bitcoin's 11 years old. It's, you know, it's, it's done a lot. DeFi is basically just starting to happen. So let me back up. So when he talks about how there's only 20 trillion currency in the world, I just want to break things down what he said. So this is a visualization of all the money in the world. And this uh, was actually published May 27, 2020. So it's pretty up to date as much as we can be, even though things move so fast. So this little block right here represents 100 billion. And silver is at 43 billion. That is all the value of above ground uh, silver and silver stocks. Crypto is around 244, so pff, pretty accurate. Um, a little bit more now, but 
So, sure. Military spending, U.S. budget. Here's a big thing. Coins and banknotes, Fed's balance sheet. So you got $6.6 trillion for all the coins and banknotes. The Fed's balance sheet, and might I remind you that, it is $7 trillion, and 40% of that total has been added this year alone. So printing money like crazy. Billionaires have $8 trillion. Gold, and we'll get into this a little bit deeper, it's at $11 trillion. So $11 trillion, 47% of that is in jewelry, but the rest is in investments and so on and so forth. So sure. Fortune 500, stock markets, 89 trillion, and then narrow money. This is where they got that statistic of around 95 trillion or so. This is where it all comes down from. And just to, be, just to note, 7% of that, that is actually physical. 93% is just numbers on a ledger and it's non-physical. So it really doesn't exist at all. And then moving forward, the debt, uh, it's huge global real estate, 280 trillion. And this thing called uh, global wealth and then derivatives, which we're looking at uh, the gross market value is 11, national is 558, and it could already go to one quadrillion. So the whole thing with cryptocurrency digital assets, it's not a, just about cryptocurrency. And I talk about this in many of my videos where we shouldn't just call it cryptocurrency because it's not just currency. It's little things that we can do like tokenizing commercial, real estate, I mean, even agriculture, even stocks and bonds. We can digitalize all these different types of things and we can have a huge uh, big, or at least a bigger piece of the pie than just that one or $95 trillion uh, of actual money. Because there's just so many things that it can do that all this, these categories are going to be swallowed up whole, I believe, by digital assets. So then moving on, now we're going to talk about what projects as far as DeFi, Pantera is invested in, why they invested into it. If you had to mention three DeFi projects that Pantera is betting on at the moment, what would those be and why? Oh, we're uh, early investors in Ampleforth, and they're there uh, as well, just kind of getting known. And uh, people are realizing that their uh, stable coin has some really cool properties. And so that's one we're very interested in. We love um, Zero X uh, as well, seed investors in that project, and they are now as well taking off. So uh, those are two of the projects that, you know, we, we've been invested in and trying to help for years. and just kind of whatever uh, reason it, it's all come together just recently. So, okay. So zero X is a decentralized exchange and then Apple fourth is a, uh, a true, I believe DeFi project. It, uh, it expands or contracts as its price rises, but the bigger overall arching theme here is DeFi and DeFi. We've seen a lot of people um, get wrecked and we've seen some people make a ton of money, but there's an article that just came out. Actually, this was yesterday. This is Masari founder says the greater fool theory will soon crush DeFi traders. So Masari is a crypto analytics firm and they have their pulse on what is going on in cryptocurrency digital assets. So this is from the co-founder Ryan Selkis and he says, we're nearing the apex of Ponzi economics, rug pulls and yield hopping and ETH fees are going to eat too heavily into non-whale profits. And he compares it to the ICOs in 2017, which is what I do too, because it's kind of how I see it. ICOs boom for a while because everyone laughably thought there would be a coordinating utility for every industry. DeFi is just one big pool of capital sloshing around a small group of insiders and mercenaries who will soon run out of victims to fleece. So I think that's a pretty harsh statement. And me personally, I think DeFi has its place. It's going to be big. The question is, which one of the projects are actually going to move forward and leave all the other junk behind? Because there's so many out there. But this comes back to our original talking, talking point where we said, if you're a little bit younger, maybe take a bit of risks or a lot more risks. Maybe if you're an older investor, don't take as many. However, I believe that everybody should take some risky positions. And that could be like 1%. 3%, 10%, depends on, on what your personal preference is. But um, there is an asymmetrical return on a lot of these projects. It just depends on which one is actually going to be. That's just my two cents. And then building on that ample fourth comment that he said, this is from, it's another uh, piece from Daily Hoddle. This is uh, Nicholas Merton. He's also data, da well, he is data dash. And he says that there's one altcoin poised to outperform Bitcoin as crypto markets search for direction. And what he says essentially is, in the meantime, the analyst says, Merton, the DeFi bull run is not over yet. He expects ample fourth to be a top gainer while Bitcoin moves sideways. I'll link this article in the description below, but let's move on. And here Dan's going to talk about asymmetrical investments, and it really makes sense and it crystallizes the things we're trying to talk about here on this channel. Let's listen. Yeah, so most investments that a typical investor does, you can kind of make or lose about the same amount of money. If you invest in, you know, a normal stock, 
it might go up 30%, but it might go down 30%. And so your upside and your downside are roughly the same. They're kind of in the same ballpark. Asymmetric bets are ones where your upside is just so much bigger. Factors are maybe orders of magnitude bigger than your downside. Uh, cryptocurrency is the extreme example of that. Often looking for um, trades like that. I was an early investor in Tesla Motors when it was a, you know around a billion or two market cap. If they're going to revolutionize the entire transportation sector, yeah, you could lose a billion or two, but it could go up, you know, now 150 billion. So I'm always looking for trades like that. And crypto is by far the most extreme of those. And that's the big thing. So like in the traditional markets, when you put it into uh, stocks, yeah, yeah, you could you could put a thousand bucks in and you could lose a thousand dollars. That's just how it is. That's, you know, not that uh, common, but sure, it'll go down or it can go up, but you could lose everything. And the same thing with cryptocurrency assets. I mean, you could invest and lose a thousand, but what if it goes up 10x, at 20x, 100x? And that's what we've seen over the years going back to 2015. Now, what's going to happen in the next five years is anybody's guess. But the money that you put in could potentially be a huge gainer. However, you have to understand that uh, a lot of these will not be winners and uh, the market will shake it out. But again, there is some huge upside and that's why we do asymmetrical investing. Next one's pretty interesting. It, it talks about, and we had talked about this on the channel about the uh, Bitcoin elevator pitch and how it compares when people say, well, there's no real value in, in gold or there's no real value in Bitcoin and it doesn't, have, it doesn't have an intrinsic value. This is perfectly put in by Dan where he talks about, you know, gold and a store of value, even Jackson Pollock paintings and melting down pennies. Let's take a listen. Uh, when you trade currencies like the euro against the dollar, there's some data like current account deficits, interest rates, and that's what people use to determine whether they want to be long the euro or short the euro. That's the same with cryptocurrencies. Uh, there's tons of information on the number of transactions, the fees that are being paid to the transaction processors, the number of GitHub commits. You know, there's there's a ton of data, so it's it's actually quite similar. The the other perspective is, you know, gold doesn't have any cash flows. It's just an inert element. It's you know, it's been around for billions of years, uh, but people store a ton of wealth in it because it's worked for five thousand years. You know, Bitcoin's only worked for eleven years, so it's it's not. It doesn't have the same uh, five millennia of, of history, but it has worked. And so, you know, every year more and more people want to store their wealth in Bitcoin. And that's a way to view the, the, the value of Bitcoin. And if it's useful for people for storing wealth, they'll keep doing it. Right. Still, gold might have zero cash flow like Bitcoin, but gold is used to make jewelry, for example. People are wearing it, while Bitcoin can't be used for these sort of things. Now, uh, you can do a lot of other cool things, though. You can send money around the world. You can put property titles on Bitcoin. You can do a lot of cool things. And I'll come back to your first uh, kernel of a, a thought there is that there's no intrinsic value. There is some intrinsic value to gold that, you know, you can do dental fillings and you can do jewelry. But the vast majority of gold is held just purely for monetary reasons. It's, it's not for uh, other reasons. And, and you say that, you know, paper currencies are backed by um, the government. With the exception of being able to extinguish tax liabilities, there's no other thing that a currency can do, you know, that, that Bitcoin can't do. Um, and so there isn't really any backing. It, there used to be, right? Of course, um, $10 bills used to be exchangeable into silver. Um, you used to be able to convert any U.S. currency into gold at $32 per ounce. Obviously, they printed so many pieces of paper, they could no longer exchange uh, pieces of paper for gold at $32 per ounce, and now it's you know, $1,900 per ounce. Um, and even the, the fun one is, uh, in the United States, we've debased the currency so much that the metal currencies are now worth much more as metal than they are as representative money. And uh, in my lifetime, the silver-colored coins used to be silver, and now they're made out of really cheap metals. And even pennies used to be made out of copper, but they've printed so many of them that they're more valuable now to be melted down and just used to, to make wires or whatever one wants to do with copper. And when people talk about there's no intrinsic value, if you try and access the intrinsic value in a penny, it's a federal felony with five years in prison. So, you know, although you could say there's intrinsic value in money, you can't access it. And my best example of that would be the intrinsic value of a Jackson Pollock painting is 40 bucks. It's some canvas and some house paint. But it has a 70-year track record of being a good store of wealth. And so Bitcoin only ha has an 11-year track record, but there's 
you know, there's no requirement that it has some kind of physical tangibility. If it is good at storing wealth, more people will use it. And that's basically why the price goes up. The more people that want to use it to do something, store wealth or whatever it is they're doing, uh, makes the price go up. So from there, perfect. Anytime someone talks to you about when you're trying to explain them about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, just say, well, there's no real intrinsic value or, you know, the, uh, the, the fiat currency, the dollar, the euro, the pound, whatever else it is, that is uh, backed by, by the government. And you can just say, look, it doesn't matter what is backed by the government or what intrinsic value is. We give it value because we say it has value. So just like gold has value because we say it has value. And yes, it does have a very long history. Just take a look at art and paintings and things like that. Uh, those things have massive value and they are used as store of value by most of the rich, let's just be honest, and they can store their money into that. Same thing's gonna happen with Bitcoin. And not to mention, guess what? I don't have to pack up a Jackson Pollock painting. I don't have to hire major security to, to move gold across the planet. I can zip Bitcoin anywhere in the world at the snap of a finger, and it's only gonna take like 20, 30 minutes. Can your gold do that? Can your Pollock painting do that? No, it can't. So that is that. And next up, the favorite part, is the price prediction let's take a listen yeah so there's two th two ways you can uh project into the future or what the price of, of crypto will be is one is to look at what's happened during all the the, ha the previous halvings and um they've had big impacts on price and if you take the stock to flow from the first two halvings and extrapolate it out to the third it would imply a price of 115 thousand dollars per bitcoin in august of next year uh, and the logic on that is the first having had a massive impact. There's only 10 million Bitcoins outstanding. We we're going from 50 every 10 minutes to 25. Um, and so it was about 16% of the entire stock of Bitcoins were being pulled out of the market. That had a huge impact. The second having, uh, obviously the having bit was half as big, but the stock was even bigger. So it was only a third as impactful in terms of the stock to flow. It was about 5% of the existing Bitcoins being removed from the supply, and that had one third the impact on price. Might have been a coincidence, but it's a nice coincidence. Uh, and then this one will be about a third as big as the prior one. So if it has that same ratio of an impact, it would imply that Bitcoin would go up to 115,000 next August. So perfect. This is pretty much the exact same thing I was talking about with my conservative take a look as uh, as far as Bitcoin, what the price could be. So I just take a look at the first having, second having, and third. The date of the first halving, this is the very first one it ever was, November 2012. At that point, the price was $12 for a Bitcoin. How nice would that have been? Then uh, on December 2nd, 2013, roughly one year, it went up to almost $1,000. That was an 8,000% increase. The second one, on July 9th, 2016, the price was 650 bucks, still a great price for Bitcoin. And then roughly a year and a half later, on December 2017, it was almost 20,000. So from 8,000 to 3,000, uh, you reduce it by about a third, right? Round numbers, we'll just, we'll just stick with that. So, and then third halving, this just happened in May. And this was a guess, because I had put the, I had made this in uh, January or February of uh, this year. And I thought, ah, oh, it's gonna be about May 16th. And it was like May 12th, May 11th. And uh, the price was, I thought, going to be around 10000 and it was. If you take a look at just time frames, I mean, the first halving to go to all-time high took a year. Second halving to get the all-time high took a year and a half. So maybe the third halving will take two years. Who knows? And then the increase, you decrease by, or it was about a third, 3000 8000 3000 Take that by about a third, you get about 1,000%. Or excuse me, 10,000 times 10x would be about $100,000 per Bitcoin. And that, again, could take two years. It could take one year. Who knows? But that's how I've always kind of seen Bitcoin, around $100,000. Some people will say 250. Some people will say 400. Some people, some crazy people say a million. I mean, maybe they're not crazy. I hope they're not crazy. That'd be great. I'd take a million. But that's where I see it. But the big thing is this. You and I have a long time to accumulate Bitcoin and to actually see it go up. Now, you can accumulate other you know, low-ranking um, altcoins. You can get into DeFi and all that stuff, sure. But for me, I think, well, if this is going to be a 10x type of thing, why would I put a lot of my money into that? Because that's a pretty good asymmetrical investment. And not that it, it's definitely going to happen, but if we take a look at the history, uh, maybe it could actually hit that mark. I think it will. A lot of people uh, in the traditional market think it will not, but uh, they bet against Bitcoin and they've all been wrong. So we will see. 
And lastly, this was pretty good. This is just Dan talking about what he invests in right now. And it's pretty much the exact same thing I do. And I appreciate Dan's commitment to digital assets. Because I spent all day doing this and I have very strong conviction that this is a great trade. Not even remotely saying that's what the average person should do because it's highly volatile, very speculative. Um, typical person should have a few percent of their portfolio in, in crypto. Uh, and then the second question is what else do I invest in? And, and like Mike Novogratz calls sometimes talk about the Brazilian real or whatever. I don't invest in anything other than crypto. Uh, crypto is so captivating and has such uh, better risk reward characteristics than the S and P 500 or, you know, whatever else you could be trading that I haven't traded anything else for seven years. Okay, so you're basically saying that you don't own any um, traditional assets besides cryptocurrency. Yeah, the balance is essentially cash and real estate, things I don't have to think anything about. Exactly. So it all depends on what you want to do, right? If you're like, I want to get rich tomorrow, well, then look at the, at the risky DeFi. I mean, the riskiest DeFi projects, a lot of money to be made, a lot of money to lose there as well. But uh, you got to be a shark. Or if you're like me, like, you know what? I think as time goes on, uh, these types of assets are going to accumulate and accumulate fast. I think it's an asymmetrical investment, especially cryptocurrency, digital assets. I mean, money. I mean, I have to have uh, dollars in my bank accounts for all my businesses. And the last one is land. Land is like my favorite thing of all time because I don't do anything. I just buy the land and then, you know, just sit on it for like, you know, five, 10 years and like, what is it now? Oh, it went up. Didn't do anything. Fantastic. Easiest investment out there. So look, that is it for today. I know it's a lot to take in, but it was important. I thought it was a fantastic uh, interview. And if you get a chance, uh, check out Cointelegraph. They've got, first of all, they got a great website, and I pull I pull a lot of data from them. And also, you know, with their YouTube channel, they have some. Sometimes they have some boring guests. I'll just be honest. But this one was a great interview, and I appreciate it. So that is it. And lastly, let me say this. Thanks for sticking with me through the end of the video. Really appreciate it. Uh, if you don't know, we have a second channel. It's called Digital Asset News Clips. And what we try to do is two things. First of all, we try to break down the clips that we do of all the different segments so it saves people time. And that is good because time is money. And not everybody has uh, a lot of time to listen to me ramble on for 40 minutes plus. The second thing is, is we needed to put a secondary YouTube channel because YouTube loves to break apart or ban cryptocurrency digital asset uh, different YouTube channels, which has happened to some top YouTubers out there. And we don't want to be those people. I mean, we still have our, our library account and cinnamon and all those things, but uh, we get a whopping like 10 views a day or 20 views a day. So no one's going there. So what we try to do is get a secondary channel and save you time. So if you got a chance, go over there and check out Dan Clips. I also do videos that are exclusive, like the last two I did, where I talked about how to transfer crypto from uh, your Voyager to your Celsius. And by the way, I have 25% of my portfolio of crypto in on the Celsius wallet. And the second thing I talked about here was, uh, should I put my holdings in stable coins and why that's actually a good or bad idea. And I'll just be doing those types of exclusive clips uh, over for Dan, just to kind of get everything going. So that is it for today. Thanks so much for watching, appreciate it. And I'll see you on the next.